computers and the internet. So let's dive in using our regular frame that we do for any new medium that we're talking about. And remember that's what are the forces at work. And it's the technological innovation, which in this case is the invention first of the computer and then of the internet, the World Wide Web, uh, leads to an increasing democratization of information that it spread more widely than just among the elites, and that those forces are influenced by the role of the market and the role of government regulation. Uh, is it commercially viable? And what does the government do to shape policy that can have an impact on how the future of that new technology takes place and what it means? And in this case, the computer and the internet, we're still in the process of seeing a lot of how government will be looking at the internet. Certainly the internet has been a remarkable commercial success in many cases, though it had its ups and downs, as we know from the dot-com bust of 2000. <clears throat> but it certainly has helped to democratize information, put it into the hands of people who never had access to information before. You know, when I was a kid, I got into trouble because when we got our first telephone, I discovered that you could pick up the receiver and an operator would answer. You didn't even have to dial in those days. You just lifted up the receiver and the operator said, can I help you? And um, I, I asked my mother what that was all about. And she said, well, they, the, the, you have the information person at the other end. That's what they called them, the information lady. Well, I thought that was just wonderful because I kept picking up the phone and asking her all kinds of questions, you know, the kinds of pesky questions that kids ask, like, why is the sky blue and why is the grass green and all those kinds of questions. At the end of the month, my parents were not overly thrilled with me because it turned out there was a fee for each time you asked a question of the information lady. Um, <clears throat> but that was what I had hoped it would be. Uh, needless to say, half the time they didn't answer my questions, but sometimes they humored me. What we have now, of course, is the Internet. You can go out and you can ask any question and you can get it answered. So it is by far the most profound change in the way that we interact with media. Um, it has dramatically changed the whole scope of media and the way in which we interact with media. And I think we're only beginning to see the outlines of what it can do for us. <clears throat> so let's start off. First, I wanted to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, because artificial intelligence is related to this in many ways. The computer allows us to be able to store so much information and so much data in a rapidly retrievable format that we are reaching the point where we think that computers can begin to not only think as well as we do, but outthink us. You know, what humans are not good at is mathematical computations. A few of us are um, in rare cases, but for most people, being able to multiply a six-digit number by another six-digit number is something that computers are really good at, but we're not very good at. On the other hand, we're very good at what's called pattern recognition. We can understand things. We can put things together. We can take a fact from over here. You know, spring means that the maple syrup starts to run. And then we can combine it with another fact over here about how, well, climate change is changing the climate, so maybe that'll have an impact on syrup production. And what will that do to maple syrup prices? We're very good at pattern recognition and can make those kinds of changes, uh, those kinds of assessments. But will computers reach the point they can already outcompute us in most cases? They can think faster than we can when it comes to mathematical problems. But will they be able to put A together with B and synthesize into C and D and then make a new connection to E and F and be able to do the kinds of things that human brains can do? Well, one of the things that we know is that the computers are getting better and better at this. Um, now, I am going to direct you, if you're on a cell phone or if you're on a computer, you can go to Alice and put in the words into Google also, uh, artificial intelligence, and then put silver edition in there. And that'll bring up the site that is for the Alice bot, the Alice bot. You can ask Alice questions, and she is an artificial intelligence bot. Okay, so that's kind of fun. You can play with Alice. We can play with the free version. <clears throat> but one of the questions that people have always had is, how would we know if computers actually reach the point where they can think better than we can? And what do we do for that? That is actually the Turing test, named after the Alan Turing, who was a very famous, there's a great movie out about him I think you should see, but uh, he was a person who worked on the Enigma system in England, helped to bring the end of World War II, brilliant man, hounded by the government for his homosexuality. Very sad story. He killed himself, and it's a truly tragic story. But Alan Turing, there is a test named in his honor called the Turing test, T-U-R-I-N-G, the Turing test. And what the Turing test says is that if you, the way you can tell 
whether we have reached the point of having actual artificial intelligence, is if you could hide somebody behind a screen and you wouldn't know whether that somebody is a computer or a person, and if you could talk with that person for five minutes and not be able to tell the difference, not be able to be sure whether it was a human being or whether it was a computer, and if indeed you were talking to a computer, it would mean that computers had reached the point that they had reached artificial, they had reached human intelligence because you couldn't trip them up, because you couldn't tell the difference between them and a human. So I would suggest that you go to Alice and take a moment and bring up Alice and then ask some questions and see if you can find out. Ask a question that reveals whether Alice is human or whether Alice is a bot. How would you conduct your own Turing test with Alice? Hmm. Now I'm going to tell you, if you've already gone and done the little test yourself, um, that I had a student once who I thought asked one of the best questions ever. <clears throat> he asked Alice, do you have a navel? Because if you don't have a navel, then the chances are you're not human. And I thought that was a pretty good question. Um, we do know, though, that there are concerns about what's happening with the advent of the computer in terms of uh, artificial intelligence. We have the old Isaac Asimov book, iRobot. <coughs> <coughs> Isaac Asimov, the late author, was very famous for writing great books on science, but he also wrote science fiction. And his book, I, Robot, proposed these three rules. The challenge for us is if computers get to be smarter than we are, what do they need us for? Mm -hmm. And are they going to then get rid of us? Because we're actually a sort of flaky nuisance, I think, if you were uh, smart enough to be part of artificial intelligence. So what they were trying to construct, what he was trying to construct in his fiction, were these rules so that uh, robots wouldn't be able to harm us. But what we see is that um, maybe robots are going to be more of a help than a harm. Ray Kurzweil in the Age of Spiritual Machines, <coughs> excuse me, Kurzweil is famous for inventing all sorts of keyboard uh, electronics in the 60s and 70s, and he has gone on to really become a guru of this whole new world of what computers and artificial intelligence can bring us. In the book of the Age of Spiritual Machines, he talks about the singularity where we may actually be able to merge with computer intelligence, that for a while they will be our companions and our personal assistants, but that at some point we will reach what he calls the singularity, where we will be able to have a sort of fused intelligence between um, humans and machines. Maybe in my case, as I age, I'll be able to download all my memories into a hard drive and I'll achieve immortality by having that hard drive be able to go on into the future and think just as I do. So those are the things that we may be looking at. We may be seeing an advent of automated computers who are automatons that are able to do work for us. Um, but again, we have to be careful because Elon Musk, for example, um, he is uh, putting 10 million into the issue of deciding what can we do to make sure that we are not ensuring our own doom by setting up robots that turn out to be smarter than we are and don't need us. I do think there'll be a day where we can put a jack in the back of our head and then a computer in between and the jack in someone else's head. And maybe the day will come when I can actually tour your brain by using a computer interface and be able to think through your mind. Those are the kinds of questions that we're getting to. Hmm. So the future of computers in the internet and the idea of a sort of hive brain located out there on the internet that exchanges information at a ballistic rate and is able to outthink us, that's a future that I don't know. Uh, we're going to have to be very creative to figure out how we're going to tame that future. <clears throat> but let's look, as we often do, at the history of our new medium and some of its early roots. And we'll start out by taking a look at some of, I think, um, you know, your book does a pretty good job of wrapping up what happened. But I would like to focus on a few of the sort of neglected women in the history of computer science. <clears throat> I think all too often it is a male-dominated field. <clears throat> and we don't realize the role that women have played in bringing us the computer and bringing us the Internet. Ada Lovelace Byron married to the poet Lord Byron. She worked with Charles Babbage and advanced his work. And um, she wrote what was arguably the first computer program ever. So they're talking about, you know, this goes back quite a way. The idea, the cons concept for a computer um, goes back hundreds of years, but the ability to be able to build one is a relatively recent phenomenon. The other person I'd like to draw to your attention is Grace Hopper, and Grace Hopper, who's a 
tenured math prof who left her family in order to join the Women's Army Corps, I believe it was, um, after Pearl Harbor because she, she believed that you know we owed it to the country to try to save it. Uh, she invented the computer compiler and she invented the computer language called COBOL. So that's quite an achievement. Fortran and COBOL were two early computer languages that were in wide use. Now, I wanted to tell you that one of the, the two stories that I love about Grace Hopper are the one that, uh, you know, we talk about a bug in the computer. There's a bug in the computer. Well, in the old days, these computers were these huge mainframes. They filled, you know, a big room at a university, you know, and just they had very little memory compared to our computers today, but they were these huge machines. And all of a sudden, the machine went on the fritz one day, and Grace was rooting around in there trying to figure out what might have gone wrong mechanically in the operation. And what she did was she discovered there was an actual bug inside the machine, and it had sort of shorted out what was happening. And so she pulled it out of there and it worked. And so that's where we got the term, I may be apocryphal story, but it's a great story, that Grace Hopper invented the term that we have computer bugs because it was an actual bug. You know, the bug caused the problem. The other thing that I love about Grace is that in the year they awarded the first Computer Science Man of the Year Award <coughs> in 1969, they had to give it to Grace. And I, as you can tell by the title of the award, they weren't expecting to have to award worry about giving a woman an award in that case. <coughs> There's another woman who, in the history of the computer, Jean Jennings Bartik in 1945. Walter Isaacson's new book says that men were better at hardware and the women at software, and she was an early software designer. So we have a lot of women who made an early mark. But when we do take at the or look at the origins of the internet and email, it's primarily an, an all-male group in a lot of cases because a lot of this was done by the military, um, ARPANET and then DARPANET. These are systems that were designed originally. The internet grew out of the goal to be able to have uh, researchers, and particularly people working on military projects, be able to share data over a distributed system and use this kind of opportunity to hook up computers to one another and be able to share information. And as you can see by the look of the group there that's uh, uh, with us in the uh, internet and email slide there, that the, these guys are mostly guys. And that's what happens typically when you do see this sort of situation where it is part of um, you know, a military operation. Um, early computer, one of the first ones was Univac. It was quite famous. It filled up, I think, something, a couple, a few city blocks. I mean, it was amazing how much space it took. One of the things we see with so many media is that they start out being huge and then they get miniaturized, right? The smaller and smaller they get. Um, radios have periodically gone through this, or they'll, every once in a while we got the big boombox throw, you know, the throwback to the earlier era because somebody decided they really wanted to see a large boombox, not just a tiny little transistor radio. So we see miniaturization, miniaturization as part of what tends to happen with technology. We were building these large computers, but in many ways we didn't know what they would do. We, they were able to do computations, they would be able to have, um, you know, uh, little flashing lights and be able to give you results. You could type things in on a black screen and it would do certain mathematical computations for you. But practical applications were another matter. The difficulty for trying to popularize this was what exactly did it do? You know, we've talked about how when radio was invented, nobody knew for sure what it was going to do. What kind of medium was it going to be? Was it actually going to be useful to people? <clears throat> Well, we see in the case of the Internet that there were basically, until you could make it user-friendly, and that was part of that, was what was called the GUI, the GUI, the Graphical User Interface, and the invention of the mouse, so that you didn't have to type everything in on a keyboard. You could go around the screen and you could click on things and make things happen. I really believe people are just born to click. I've watched, you know, young infants who have never seen a computer before, just they want to click on things, they want to use the mouse to click, they want to click on a tablet. Uh, it must be that it just we had to live long enough as a species for the invention to come along so that we could use that click impulse. Some of the heroes of that early movement were obviously Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And it's kind of an interesting rivalry when you look back on it. I mean, it really was. Steve Jobs and Gates were very different kinds of people. They certainly had very different outcomes. Gates, you know, is uh, still out there trying to change the world now through his foundation. Jobs died tragically young. Very different kinds of people. Um, but they sort of were duking it out for which one would be the dominant system. 
uh, Jobs said basically he invented the future in his garage with Steve Wozniak. I mean, he was he was he really he could envision how this machine, which had been primarily just for university people and military people, shared by only an elite few, could become something that people would want to have in their homes. That seemed so astounding in that era. Nobody could see any reason why anybody would want a computer in their home. <clears throat> and it was almost the difference too between art and commerce. You know, the Steve Jobs built beautiful machines, more expensive, but elegant and simply elegant. And they operated in an elegant fashion. Um, Bill Gates built machines for business. I mean, he built stuff that people use to be able to do different kinds of things in a business setting. If we take a look, Larry Ellison at Oracle, was, he invented Lotus. Lotus was the spreadsheet that made the, all the difference in Wall Street, all the difference in business, being able to keep your records in a computer format, easily retrievable. <clears throat> this made a huge change in the business world, but the idea of bringing part of that, so we've seen it sort of meld together, where business and art and commerce all come together in the computer. Another one of the early battles that went on in the computer landscape was the uh, battle between Netscape and Microsoft Internet Explorer. Um, the next big invention was the browser, the ability to use the internet and go out after, I mean, email was the killer app. Email meant that I could email somebody and instantaneously flash that message to them. Email was a huge deal. But beyond that was also the browser, the browser where you pulled up your email program and the browser that you used to search for things and be able to go find things on the net. <clears throat> and what happened was that uh, who gained ascendancy had something to do with both government regulation and also with commercial, with how much uh, money it could make. Netscape decided that they were a beautiful little early browser. I use Netscape all the time and it cost $35 a year, um, basically a year. They used to sometimes upgrade sooner than a year, but well, once a year you'd have to pay another $35 to get the new Netscape and it would do more fabulous things than the previous version had done. Well, Microsoft got smart and said, wait a minute, the browser is the future. We have the operating system. We have the Microsoft operating system in Windows. But what we really want to control now is the future of the net, which is the browser. And so with the invention of Internet Explorer, they had their own version of the browser. And where they had an advantage was they were willing to give it away for free. The net loves free. We all love free on the Internet. So they just bundled it with the rest of their operating system software. In fact, it was very difficult to get rid of it if you didn't want it. And it would automatically come up on your computer when you installed your Windows software and you installed your upgrade, you'd get your new Internet Explorer. I got news for you. I don't care how good something is. It's awful hard to compete with free. And Internet Explorer began to take over the landscape. So first we see that commercial things drive choices. Indeed, if you can get something for free, you'll get it for free, especially if it's a decent product. The second thing that made a difference, however, was that in other countries, people were concerned that uh, Microsoft was making a monopoly move, trying to dominate the operating system by intertwining its own browser, and it was welded in there, so you had a hard time getting it out. They were concerned about Microsoft being too dominant in the business, and there were a lot of court cases internationally that went further and were more dramatic than in the United States. The United States kind of let Microsoft get away with that for quite a while, even though it obviously in many ways was in violation of some of the business practices that we try to enforce in this country about monopolies. Microsoft became in many ways the dominant browser. We now have obviously Mozilla and Firefox and others and Google Chrome, but the browser wars have continued to a degree because the, the, the internet and the browser is really the future of what the uh, computer is all about. Another thing you need to know about is Moore's Law. Moore's Law said that the computing power of a chip doubles every 18 months or in what that also means is or the price is chopped in half. So we're constantly getting faster and faster and faster, even down to the point now that where they're talking about using quantum mechanics in order to be able to dissipate the heat so that we can have faster and faster computers. It's been fairly spectacular, the ability of computers. When I first started building, I built my first website in 1996. And um, when I built that website, all you could put on was an image, a few lines of text. You could change headlines a bit. You could use various tags to change the size of the type on the screen, but you were quite limited in what you could do, even in terms of interactivity, let alone multimedia. Now you can stream video. You can do wonderful things. You could do live webcasts. You have all these other opportunities. 
And we have seen over the years that these various killer apps come along. First is email, second is the browser, and then maybe what we're looking at nowadays is the, the ability for webcasting and all sorts of other things that are going to take the internet to an even more ambitious level than it is right now. But let's talk a little bit about the ups and downs of the business side of the internet. There was a huge boom at the beginning. <clears throat> And I was part of it. I was going around the country doing workshops all over the place, showing people. I'd put together the first online training course for police in 1998. I had put, uh, I was ran for Congress on the Green Party ticket in 2000. I had the first campaign blog of anybody running for Congress. So I had this, uh, you know, sort of background. I was a, an early web pioneer. I was part of the Web Cities team that went around the country. Sean Parker of Napster was part of it. Jeffrey Veen of Wired. I wasn't up at that caliber, but um, they, we had a lot of really top name people. And we went around the country and doing all sorts of workshops. And what we saw was this sort of internet bubble take place. A bubble is where, you know, all of a sudden a stock price just begins to take off. Um, you know, everybody thought that they could do get rich quick on the internet. After all, I mean, people were competing to be able to own things like air.com. Why would owning air.com make you rich? Nobody really knew, but it was so new and you wanted to get in on the ground floor. What we saw was it went from dot-com boom to dot-com bust. And it happened between 1999 and the year 2001. You could just see the dramatic difference. <coughs> An IPO is an initial public offering, and that's when you first bring your stock to the market to be part of the New York Stock Exchange. In 1999, as you can see on the slide there, there were 457 IPOs, and 117 of those doubled their value within a day. So if you had $100 invested, the next day you had $200. Hmm. That's not a bad rate of return on investment in a 24-hour period. But then the bubble burst. People began to ask, how are you really going to make money with that air.com site? What are you going to do? We saw things like pet.com go down the tubes and different kinds of websites go down the tubes because they really couldn't live up to their potential. And so all of a sudden there was this bust and those prices went down. Um, this harkens back to an era and it was the tulip craze in Holland in the 1600s. At one point in today's dollars, a tulip bulb in Holland was worth $35,000, which is just astronomical, right? That's because of its scarcity. There were very few of them. And when things get scarce and everybody wants them, it drives the price up, as we know from the laws of supply and demand. Well, the same thing happened with these tulip bulbs. It was very much like the old, you know, dot-com boom, right? But the problem with those tulip bulbs was it turned out the reason that these tulip bulbs, that they had these fancy ones that um, they, they, they looked, they were all ripply and they had little black streaks and they were just gorgeous, very different. And they were the ones that were so valuable, right? Well, it turned out that was because they had a virus in them and they were a fungus and they were busy, uh, eventually collapsed completely because you couldn't grow any more of them. And so the market went bust. <coughs> the same thing happened somewhat with the computer market. All of a sudden there was a slump and the bubble bursts and the NASDAQ plunged by two thirds. Wow, I mean, it was stunning. Loss of $7 trillion. Um, we saw one company, mp3.com, which I had been using for uh, building mp3s, putting up mp3s of songs that I, music that I was doing, went from a value of 2.5 billion to zero. I mean, that's just a staggering loss of money. The problem was that people really didn't know how they were going to make money on this, and it took decades to build back the trust that the Internet was going to have the potential for commerce that we had always hoped that it would. So let's look a little bit. Uh, what we're talking about as well, um, <coughs> um, uh, we can now see that the future is going to be in maybe things like 3D printers, Maybe things like Watson, the IBM computer with artificial intelligence, being able to take over functions that we have in other areas now. Um, we can see a 3D printer nowadays. So we're getting to the point where we can print a human kidney in order to be able to transplant one into a human being without having it rejected. On the dark side, we see that there are individuals who are actually printing plastic guns that will not be detected if they want to get them onto the airline airplane. That's not a good thing. The, so far, the only thing that saves us is that pretty much the firing pin and the bullet have to be metal and therefore detectable. So what's going to happen with the future? 
Um, the computer is what's called a disruptive technology. <coughs> it changes the past. We've talked before about how new technologies and new media don't really destroy the past. They just force previous uh, inventions and previous media to reinvent themselves. They're disruptive. So they're going to bring about a new kind of world. Let's take a little bit of a look at all of what's happened with social media. That's been, you know, here's just a list of all the different kinds of social media options that people have nowadays. Obviously, there are the big ones that everybody uses, but there are always people eager to try to find a new one, a new niche that's going to make a difference. I mean, I remember when Twitter first came out and I started to read a Twitter feed and it was just seemed like I was reading somebody's stream of consciousness. It was very strange and I wasn't quite sure how that was going to shake out. But very quickly, people found out uses for it. Crowdsourcing of stories for journalists, being able to share information quickly, see what's trending in the society at the time. So that it eventually shakes out and new media either make it or they don't. And that's part of what happens. Let's take a look at sort of the history of how it is that we, the evolution of media. We started out in the old days, for example, using the newspaper as a mass media, one to many. You printed a newspaper, you sold it to many people. They got all the same information in their hands from the media company selling it to them, a nickel on a street corner. Then there was segmented media. They began to realize that we're not just one big monolithic culture, that many of us group together into tribes around special interests. Maybe it's Popular Mechanics magazine that appealed to the people who loved that kind of thing. Maybe it's something like fashion magazines that appealed to, and we talked then about segmented media. It's one to a few. It's a niche. It has to be large enough to be able to support the medium that's trying to get it to them. But in this case, that's where we see things like magazines, segmenting the media into different kinds of audiences. With the advent of the smartphone, what we see is personal media, <clears throat> one to one. We can still use social media to broaden that audience, but we start out with the one to one. Social media, on the other hand, allows us to go many to many. So I can use my cell phone, my smartphone, to call somebody or to text them. Or I can go on to Facebook and I can broadcast a message to the, to the 2,000 some people who follow me on Facebook. Okay, so it's an interesting new device to be able to share information in this new kind of way. And the smartphone has gone a long way toward dramatically changing the evolution of the media. <coughs> We started out in the browser with what was called the static web. It was that website I put up in 1998, 17 pages, um, a block of text, a photo on each page, and you just went sequentially bap, 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 that's all you could do. And there was my email address at the end, that's all I had. That's the static web. It was very much like television. You sort of passively consume the media. It's not something that you interact with. The next evolution was the multimedia web. All of a sudden, we could add images, we could add um, video, we could add audio, we could do podcasting, we could do live streaming. Woo, all of a sudden, that really dramatically impacts the kinds of stories that we can tell. We will not only tell you something, we will show you. But that's still pretty much, in many ways, a lot like the um, old-fashioned television set where you sit there passively in front of it. But then what we came up with was the interactive web, where you can fill out a form, you can answer questions, you can do a poll, you can uh, set up things where you can share information with other people, you can upload your image to go at the bottom. The social web carries that so far. I mean, it is the greatest source of interactivity on the web. I can reply to somebody's comment on the picture that I put up of something that I did this morning. I mean, that's a real opportunity to be able to share information, ideas, opinions as quickly as possible. And that is very much media. That's what media does. Media allows us to have this sort of conversation. I'm now going to give you a brief history of a few of the major um, sort of milestones of the past in media history, in online uh, history, in Internet history. Uh, these are ones that are personal to me. I was around and participated in some of them. Um, I think they're very important conceptually in telling us how the web was shaped by the ideas of various people. The first one was called the Clue Train Ma Manifesto. And what it talked about was that it, the Internet was going to change the relationship between the buyer and the seller and turn it into a conversation. In the past, the buyer you know, was looking for something, the seller had a product, it was basically, here it is, I've advertised it to you, buy it or don't. 
But what happens now in this new world <clears throat> is that people can talk about products. They can share information. I can go on Twitter and say, don't go to that restaurant. I just got a bad taco there, right? And use Yelp maybe to give you a rating so that you'll know not to go to that place. It's changing the nature of the conversation. It's allowing individuals to be able to share their ideas and their information about these different kinds of technologies, um, you know, rate things, uh, change the whole conversation. Um, there is a uh, another book that I want you to know about from the past. These were turned into books. They started out as websites where they were part of the conversation. Many people contributed to the Clue Train Manifesto. I was one of the people that popped up and uh, offered up something to be added to the list. It was a book that grew organically in some ways out of the contributions of people around the net saying, let's think through how this is changing the relationship between buyer and seller. Another book that I found absolutely fascinating, and again, it was started with an article and then there were many comments on it. Eric Raymond wrote it. <clears throat> it's The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And I think it's a useful frame for us to continue to talk about what's happening in the world of the computers and the Internet today, especially in terms of things like uh, sort of the difference in orientation between something like the Linux operating system and the Apple operating system. More and more what we're seeing with new technologies like smartphones, the fact that you can't hijack them, that you can't just you know reconfigure them the way that you want to, they're sealed units. <clears throat> they really are a walled garden. You're not going to climb over that fence and be able to go inside and rearrange the furniture, right? <clears throat> and then there's that idea of open source, Linux, the whole idea that people should be able to contribute and share and revise things, that the beauty of the Internet is this opportunity to share information. Information should be free. It should be shareable. We shouldn't wall it off behind a fence and then make, make people pay to be able to see it. Well, obviously, there, that's two very different visions of what the future of the world should be like. But Eric uh, Raymond set up this book idea, which I think the Cathedral and the Bazaar, <clears throat> he talked about how in the past information was kept in the cathedral. The monks were busy painting those illuminated letters and books. <clears throat> you had to go to the cathedral to be able to read the book. They were very scarce. They were precious. They were very expensive. The alternative vision was the bazaar. You could have, wow, let's go to the bazaar. There's a souk here and there's, you know, colorful things over here and somebody's selling this and somebody's selling something that's pretty close and everybody's sharing different ideas and it's a very open and free kind of environment. And those battles are still going on. We're seeing now, for example, on the smartphone. Well, should, what kind of smartphone should we have? Should we have one where only, you know, very expensive and you can't do anything with it except use it? You don't have an opportunity to tailor it very much? That's a very important question. So those are two books that I would ask you to think about in terms of the history. They're not mentioned as much as I think they should be because I think they helped shape a lot of the discussion about what's happening even on the web today. The other thing I'd like to issue I'd like to bring up is this generational divide and the digital divide. <clears throat> I'm gonna have to take a break here and answer my telephone.